the, I, I very much agree with that problem. And I think we have helped to create that problem by doing too many one-off demonstrations. Just an expression of opinion that doesn't go anywhere because then we go home. <laughs> right? I mean, I was thrilled by the Women's March the day after the inauguration. I was in San Francisco at the time, 100,000 people. It was great. I circulated in the crowd. I talked to a lot of newbies. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But so one-off it was, right? It was just that. There wasn't even a list of uh, uh, how is this the beginning of a plan. So at 4 a.m. the next morning, I woke up and wrote a 10-point plan on what to do about Trump and the, and the economic elite and, uh, and send it out, waging nonviolence where I'm a columnist, turned it around the same day, it was out. The, the women who organized the National Women's March, the women who organized that march immediately tweeted the whole 10 points because they realized, oh right, we were so busy organizing this one-off thing, we, we forgot about, boom, 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 where do we go from here? So without a plan, it is easy for people to say, oh, well, they are just expressing their opinion. Well, that's very interesting, but obviously it's not going anywhere. That's one reason why I emphasize campaigns, because in a campaign, you dig in. You go after something over and over and over again. The first campaign that my group, uh, the Earthquaker Action Team, did was going up against the seventh largest bank in the country. Well, we were a size of a living room group. <laughs> we had a group in a living room that decided to go after the seventh largest bank in the country, which was the number one financer of mountaintop removal coal mining, which was doubling cancer rates in Appalachia, birth defect rates up, and so on. And they were killing people in Appalachia, right? And, and making money and doing it with impunity. So we decided we're going to stop them to do that. Well, did we do a one-off? No, we knew. We knew we were not going to stop anybody from doing anything serious unless we did a sustained and escalated campaign. So we won, but it took year after year after year of escalating actions. We did a 200 mile walk across Pennsylvania. We, we got arrested multiple times in multiple bank branches. We were able to do more and more bank branches in more and more states. We grew from that living room to 13 states. And that's when the bank gave up. The bank said, as far as we could tell, this group of Quakers uh, is unstoppable. We can't stop them. They just go year after year after year. They keep doing all these actions and, uh, and they keep growing and growing and growing. And they're like a cancer or something. You know, uh, uh, Gandhi, uh, I know, wrong, analogy, wrong metaphor. Yeah. Gandhi once said, if you ever think you're too small to make a difference, try spending the night in a tent with a mosquito. <laughs> So you can start small. That's not a problem. The question is, do you, does your campaign intend to sustain itself? We've done too many one-offs. And so it just looks like, OK, we feel this way. You know, Trump feels that way. We feel this way. So what? One-offs don't change anything. One-offs sometimes inspire people then to get serious about social change. But they don't, by themselves, get a change accomplished. And yet we put a lot of energy into them. So we need to change that. Another thing, we have a chapter on tactics. Um, oh, I'll, I'll just have to tell you, though, because this is a funny anecdote. So some uh, friends of mine started a campaign to stop the casino industry from invading Philadelphia, which would have been the largest city in America to have to deal with casinos. And so they, as they set up their organization, they got an agreement among the uh, two dozen people who started it. We will never do a march or rally. So they legislated that right into their DNA, which forced them to be creative. Have you done your share of marches and rallies? I've done more than my share. We get off this march and rally thing. Gene Sharp, the foremost scholar in this field, listed 200 different tactics of nonviolent direct action to do. Why are we doing marches and rallies all the time? So that's another thing. Oh, you know, the activists are out. They're doing another march, or they're doing another rally. Ho hum, right? Who is inspired by that? Another thing that's popular that plays into that dynamic in our relation to the public is running into the streets and stopping traffic. 
Oh, great. So here's this policy being laid out by the economic elite or by some bureaucrat somewhere or some, you know, or some corporation somewhere, and we stop people from getting to daycare in time to pick up their child. Disruption for disruption's sake. No, disruption for the sake of expressing our opinion when it's not going to make a difference. So it's not about disruption per se. It's about strategy. If we disrupt bank operations because we're doing a bank campaign, that's, that's not stopping mom from, or dad from picking up the child at daycare. That's disrupting bank operations because bank, the bank is the perpetrator of the evil. So it's, it's using strategy. And this is very much a strategy book that I've written. It's always about how is the specific goal that we're going after actually advanced by this action? And if it's not advanced by this action, don't do it. Value your time. Be self-respectful. Be powerful. Use your time carefully. And that then gets picked up by the public. And more and more people, of course, in the case of the bank campaign, figured out, oh my gosh, this bank, you know, I, I heard from a cousin that they were in the next town, stop disrupting that bank. Now they're in this town and disrupting a bank. I'm taking my money out. We moved $5 million out of that bank, uh, out of PNC Bank into credit unions and, you know, and the cooperative enterprises because people realized, I don't want my money to, to be supporting an institution doing this terrible thing. So that's the whole world of tactics bears looking at from the point of view that you're raising. Yes? Well, I learned that from Bayard Rustin, who influenced me a lot. He was the chief strategist for Dr. King, uh, an African-American uh, Quaker, actually, guy who had pay already paid his dues. He'd been in a chain gang in North Carolina and stuff like that before the Montgomery bus boycott even happened. So as soon as the bus boycott started, he was there mentoring Dr. King and so on. So, and he, I, I, every time he was anywhere near, I was sitting at his feet, like, you know, as your age, like, like that, right? And he, I heard him say over and over, okay, now that we've got a really strong civil rights movement, now we can you know, deliver lots and lots of uh, large-scale action. Now's the time to work on the economic side of this. Because, he said, if we don't deal with the economic structure in this country, in 50 years, we'll still have ugly, horrible racism. And, you know, could be, I don't know, <laughs> I'm 20 years old, but maybe so. Well, now I know. 50 years later, we do still have horrible, terrible racism. And if we had the strongest possible civil rights movement now that was successfully campaigning for police accountability for, for just one example of the many issues in which racism is enacted and, and, uh, and and fostered in our country, and it did not address the economic institutions, in 50 years from now, we would have terrible racism. Because racism is embedded in the economic structure, and the economic structure is embedded in the racist structure. They are, in, what's that word we were using for a while? Intersectional. They are connected, and so they cannot be separated in terms of analysis. So we gotta, we gotta put them together. Kind of put them together. Then the, the, camp, the, the, the tra trick there is to develop the campaigns that do represent intersectionality. And that's why the largely white group that I'm part of, this because Quakers are a largely white outfit, um, as soon as we started campaigning for power local green jobs, our campaign was joined by a much larger organization than ours that's, that's run by black leaders that said, hey, Power local green jobs, that's a vital interest for poor black people in our area. You are making a demand that we have a huge interest in. We're joining your campaign. I said, we didn't even ask you to. <laughs> because I felt very strongly as a white person that it would be inappropriate for a white person to ask black people to join our campaign um, because black people have their own priorities public toilets, uh, you know, the, the uh, schools being flushed down the toilet and in recently incarcerated people coming out without jobs and so on. People set their own priorities, right? Who am I to ask people to join my campaign? 
And uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the result, though, of creating a campaign of that kind was that the larger partner jumps in and says, part of your campaign, because your campaign affects our community. So that's the possibility that opens up when we really use intersectionality rather than trying to look at reality through just one lens of oppression. That's, that's my response. There are these multiple lenses. Let's use them. Another question. Yes. Multiple campaigns that create a movement, like the pipeline movement. We, we had a taste of that. We had a glimpse of that in North Dakota. So there is campaign after campaign. The North Dakota stimulated even more pipeline fights. There are more pipeline fights. I ask environmentalists who have a bigger picture than I do, a, a national picture, who's coordinating the pipeline fights? Honor our earth is the biggest group right now that has the information on their website so you can find out where the fights are. Thank the you. The Stone 3X thing is being organized through Winona LaDuke and her tribe in Minnesota. If the political like representatives aren't doing what our civic textbooks said they were supposed to do, as you say, there's a reason for that and that is because they don't have to listen to us, they listen to their controllers, mm -hmm. right? They're puppets and they've got controllers on the top who tell them what to do. And so uh, I don't bother to call uh, elected representatives. I, I think the Congress is basically uh, sold out. It's, what did they say? It's the best Congress money could buy. And, and, uh, and uh, actually, that's not even a new story. That's not even since uh, Citizens United. The Princeton, you might want to Google the Princeton oligarchy uh, study. Uh, the, uh, there's a Princeton University study that looked uh, be prior to 2002 to 20 years worth of federally made decisions, policy decisions, something like 1,600, and for each decision they asked the question, uh, where did the majority of Americans stand on that particular question and where did the economic elite stand? And they compared the two. Well, of course, often they would be the same, but many times they were different. The majority wanted one thing and the 1% wanted the other. Which one got its way, the 1%, overwhelmingly. And so the Princeton study had to conclude reluctantly, well, if democracy means majority rule, that's not what we've got. So just in case you were counting on democracy to save you, it's too late, friends, uh, and maybe has been too late for a long, long time. Uh, maybe we're just looking at the wrong place in terms of where the power lies. And that's why when we chose to go after Appalach Appalachian mountains blowing up, 500 by the, by the time we got around to focusing on it, we said to ourselves, look, uh, we could go after Obama and stiffen his spine and he controls the EPA and, you know, so permits aren't being given, but we'd rather go after the bank. Because who, who is the 800-pound gorilla in terms of lobbying with regard to Appalachia? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And the PNC Bank's vice president is also the vice president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. That's how it actually works. It's the economic elite. So go after the bank. So just as you gave the example of divestment showing up in banks because of pressure, uh, go after the economic elite. Great question. And you've hinted at the answer. They got... They made their change, as I said, in the 30s, most of them, Denmark a little earlier in the 20s, when we also had movements going that were trying to make, at least some of those movements were trying to make a similar degree of change. They succeeded and we failed. You're intuiting the answer, why? Racism could be used in our country to divide people against each other, and therefore the economic elite succeeds by uh, by, by dividing, right? And their economic elite couldn't use racism because their populations were homogeneous, relatively, and so the people could win. So that's why they're ahead of us. How cool for them. They didn't have that problem, and they were able to unite. So the question is, how can we unite across racial lines? There's nothing preventing people in some ultimate philosophical sense from uniting across racial lines. In the 30s, um, if, if it were true that it's impossible, then the, C, the, the CIO and, AF, and uh, the CIO wouldn't exist. 
That is, at a time of much greater degree of racism than now. I have this example in the book because it's so instructive for those of us who care so deeply about racism. Racism was my first issue. I was age 12 when I preached to my church that racism is, uh, is, it, that racism is the thing that they've got to deal with. Um, it's, it, it's extremely important to many of us here. I can see that. And the important thing to understand is that our own history shows us the way forward with regard to that. In the beginning of the 30s, we were a much more racist country than we are right now. Much, much more racist. We had in Detroit and Flint populations that had migrated north from Appalachia, which was extremely white people, and the deep south, black people, and they were side by side, and the car manufacturers couldn't be happier. <laughs> right? Because they love division to keep everybody down. Say, so this is a picnic. So uh, in Flint, uh, the GM would hire white workers for the good jobs and black people for janitors, right? And, and in Detroit, Henry Ford um, made deals with black pastors such that the, some black people were, more black people were hired because he knew that they would prefer to go to Ford because General Motors was, was uh, so, so extremely discriminatory. Okay, you're a union organizer. Now your job is to organize a union. How do you de deal with a situation like that? It's obviously hopeless. Turned out it wasn't. Turned out it wasn't. They created non-segregated unions, local unions, in Detroit and Flint. They did it. My book tells how. It was very, very slippery work. I mean, it was very ingenious organizing that enabled them to do that, but they did it. We, we have other examples in American history. We had sharecroppers working together, black and white, in the Deep South. So before, before we're like overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the problem of racism in the US, we need to ask ourselves, if I were a really canny organizer and wanted to learn from successes in America, where would I look, who would I talk to, and what would that open up? Because when it comes to racism, and there are other examples, LGBT is another example, I think, um, the, the cracks in the wall can be very tiny, but the really canny uh, organizer looks for the cracks and widens them. That's why it's possible to organize a movement in, uh, in Germany uh, 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 during the communist rule. That's why it was possible to organize a movement in Iran against the Shah of Iran. That's why it was possible to organize a movement in Mississippi. In 1963, SNCC organized a movement in Mississippi when there was no protection. SNCC workers went in there when the police officers that you might hope for protection locally were dressing in sheets at night and they were Ku Klux Klan members. And anybody looking, outside, looking at that from a distance would say, why do you even bother? It's obviously, uh, obviously can't be done. So, uh, yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm reflecting back on a kind of organizer's attitude. An organizer's attitude, successful organizers are, no, are characteristically optimistic. They're looking for the way forward. When things are bleak, they're looking for the way forward. They're not figuring out how it cannot be done. They're figuring out how to do it. And so what my book does is shows positive examples of how we won how we won in Detroit in the 30s with the sit-in, uh, the sit-down movement, despite the existence of racism there, how we win in a variety of situations where anybody looking at it at first glance might say, no, that can't be done, but people figured out how to do it. And that's my challenge to all of you. That's my challenge to all of you. At, at a time when the mass media are, I think, uh, channeling to us lots of reasons for despair, our challenge is to Look for the sharpest organizers we know who have done something like what we would like to do and figure out how to do it. There is a book I'm trying to remember by a sociologist, Coalition is in the title, 
And I'm, uh, I'm blanking on the, the full title, um, but you, I think you could Google for it, find it use, using the word uh, coalitions, in which he, uh, he's both an organizer and a sociologist, and he describes, especially on the West Coast, uh, examples where workers were able to work, uh, workers in the logging industry, I think, is one of the places where they were able to work in coalition with, uh, with community people in such a way as to advance common With goals, environmental goals. Oh, Earth, Earth First might be an example. Okay, that, great, great. So that gives, that gives more of a clue. Yeah, it's really, it's really tough work. In the 80s, um, I, I organized a coalition that was cross-class and cross-race, and uh, after seven years, um, I, I was burned out. I had to pass the leadership on to someone else because it was so hard. There were a lot of days I would show up in the beginning of the day and I would get there early to the office so I could have a good cry before I started. <laughs> That's how tough it was. can't tell you how many conversations I had with people complaining to me about other people in the coalition, including feminist women. Mm -hmm. Where do you get those union guys, blah, 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 yeah, and, and union guys say, where do you get these women who, who, you know, who think we should turn the whole meeting over to their concern be just because they said something early in the meeting and somebody else later said the same thing and it was accepted and they're complaining all over the place about it. But they got what they wanted, didn't they? Why are they complaining? You know, and, and all of that going on and on and on and on. And the organizer needs to be somebody who's somehow grounded enough to be able to carry all that stuff, right? All, because every, everybody's point of view is legitimate in some respect. I mean, there's re you can understand why everybody has a, has a point of view like that. And your job as an organizer is to pull people together. But you did notice I put that question mark. And one reason why I so believe in the value of campaigns, especially intersectional campaigns, is that when the stakes are lower, right, we can develop our skills. Build our chops when the when the when the stakes are lower. You know, we, we'll make lots of mistakes. Part of learning is making mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. And, uh, and but it's very nice to do them on a smaller scale, and develop our, our uh, talent uh, to be able to handle it. Yes. Do you do you know about the 1960 sit-ins in the Deep South when people went to lunch counters? Black people went to lunch counters and asked for coffee. <laughs> Yeah. For every, for every, I'm making a point. For every small group of people who did that, there was a much larger group of people said, it'll never work. Mm -hmm. It's hopeless. Why are you doing that? You're exposing yourself to enormous risk. We've had racism up the wazoo. Who's going to protect you? You're crazy mm -hmm. and all that. And the, some of those students would have had parents who would have been hysterical if they'd known. <laughs> and young people going to do those sit-ins, some of them losing, notice, some of them losing. That's really important strategically. If we think strategically, we have to understand, multiple campaigns, some lose, some win. No general ever expects to win all the, all the battles. You can win a war and lose a lot of battles. The nuclear, uh, the nuclear struggle is an example of that. The sit-in movement, there were, pe there were a number of sit-ins that failed. There were many others that succeeded. And out of that came a movement. It was called the sit-in movement. But I'm saying that all the, all the negative uh, uh, and understandable things that you are referring to, because they're all real, they all exist, are only a part of the picture. And if they were all of the picture, almost none of Howard Zinn's book, The People's History of the United States, could have been written. Please watch the film Selma. Watch the film Selma and ask yourself, what were those black people doing? They were crazy to try to pull that off. I can give a thousand reasons why they will not succeed. Right? Or an even, even more uh, spectacular movie is Freedom Song, which shows those SNCC workers going into Mississippi in 1963. I was there because I was part of the training for Mississippi Summer 1964. The second, we did it those in two batches. In two ba the reason why I'm talking so much about that is because those are situations of terror. Okay? Those are, I don't think it got any worse in the United States. 
uh, in at my lifetime than in Mississippi in 1963, 63 and 64. And there we, we had uh, northern students, students like m many people who are right here now, who decided to volunteer to go to Mississippi and do voter education. A lot of those were white students. They knew that they were risking, but they decided they showed up to the campus in Ohio where we were doing the trainings. First batch, about 450, one week, goodbye, off they go to Mississippi. Next batch come in the second week, about 450, 500, and we are training them, right? On the second day of the second week, we're called into the auditorium. Somebody very somber looking comes to the edge of the stage and says, we have very bad news. Three of the workers have been, have, have disappeared, and we have every reason to think they're dead. I'm a sociologist. I'm sitting over here on the side. I always do that, watch people. I'm a people watcher, learn a lot, right? And I'm thinking, oh my God. We have this auditorium of over 400 people. Almost all those students are gonna leave because people who were sitting in their chair last week are already dead. What's the chance? And if they don't think of leaving on the next bus back home to Connecticut or wherever, their parents will be on the phone saying, you get back home right now. But because of the quality of training, and this is something I can only refer to abstractly, and if you haven't experienced an in-depth non-violence training, there's no reason why you would know what that experience is like. But in that week of training, the SNCC workers were fantastic. They were big brothers, big sisters to the students, and uh, the rest of us in the training corps worked with those students. Almost none of them left. Almost all of them went to Mississippi knowing there was no protection, no local protection, no state protection. President Kennedy was refusing to touch it with a 10-foot pole, pole. His brother, Robert Kennedy, head of the Justice Department, was not going to get involved. And J. Edgar Hoover, head of FBI, was actively trying to, to destroy the civil rights movement. Now, I would just say to anybody who's who's arguing for impossibility, arguing for impossibility, put yourself in that situation. And you see, it transformed. It tra it tra the, the result was transforming. So if you, I'm, I'm asking a lot from you. I'm asking for a real leap of imagination. And that's one reason why in, when I was teaching, I showed films, films, films because films are art forms to help people to transcend their degree of fear and the logical work that goes on, the cognitive work that accompanies fear. Think. You want to know how to go forward, how but to go I forward in the face of all that, all that, that's, yeah. that's good. yes, especially since your speaker of the evening uh, uh, said look forward to more, uh, an increase, an intensification. Yeah. And you, and, and, you, and you want to struggle for your integrity in a situation that is very scary and is so distressing. Mm -hmm. I cry over the newspaper in the morning. I That's recommend crying. <laughs> I recommend crying. No, I think we have to accept our emotionality as human beings. We can't just expect that our rationality is going to get us through this. One reason I recommend the films, the films of the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Movement did not, was not a, an abstract, <laughs> right? It was not a bunch of rational people, you know, pe people, it was not irrational, but it made room for the human beings that we are. We suffer when we see other people suffer. Human beings are e evolved to be able to do that. I salute your empathy. People getting killed for no reason. It hurts you. It does hurt us. Friends, we need to accept the reality that it hurts us. It stings. It hurts. We cry. It's okay to cry. It's okay to storm. Dr. King, after a demonstration, would go back to the motel, and he and his colleagues would have a pillow fight. <laughs> and they'd beat each other up with pillows. I mean, because think of the control. I've been beaten by police. 
what it's like to be, you, you, you have to conduct yourself in a particular way in order to escape for you know, a, a higher degree of harm. And so you do that, but afterward, what, what, what is your physiological situation, right? You have to express it, express it, express it. You see me working out right now, I get to work out. You, you don't get to work out so much. Maybe the next time you'll all be jumping up like I am. But anyway, yeah, yeah, pay attention to that. Follow your body, follow your body. Also, it's tremendously helpful in our group, Earthquaker Action Team, that we are a team. Because the best known antidote to terror is social solidarity. Look at a youngster, look at a little one. When the lightning is striking especially close and they're scared, the hand goes out like that to grab another hand. That's human nature, folks. We never outgrow that. So get close to people. And that can be done in the campaigning group. Form campaigns not only with people who want the same goal as you want, but also people who are willing to be human with you. And we, uh, that's why I put chapters in this book. Some people say, well, you probably, George, you wrote a kind of manual like you did uh, 50 years ago for the Civil Rights Movement. And it does include some of that, but it also includes these, mat these matters that you're raising here of how do we support each other. When Trump was elected, I saw a lot of groups go, 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 and a lot of people like lose, lose momentum as activists. We just sail right through because we have that degree of solidarity with each other so that we could hold each other through it and not get what Trump wanted, which was to <laughs> spin people, right? Spin people out of, out of our momentum. And, uh, and so we, were, we didn't cooperate with Trump. So it's very tempting these days for activists to cooperate with Trump. Respond to the tweets, read the tweets, give him that, pay attention. He's a bully, he wants attention. So why are we giving him attention? The mass media, I understand why they give him attention. We don't have to pay attention. We can take care of our mental health, our spiritual health, and we can be close to each other and build the infrastructure that supports campaigns and then supports movements. I made my peace with the possibility of dying in the course of our struggle in, the, in my 20s. And what a relief to do that work so early. Because then it freed me for the rest of my life to not have to return always to uh, like that. And so subsequently I risked my life a number of times knowing, well, I already made that. I already figured that out. I already figured that out. Now, and then I, in fact, I mean, the reality is, you know, we, we risk our lives on the highways, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, there's plenty of risk around, right? And we make our peace with getting back in the car, <laughs> even, though, even though we know that. And as a society, we're risking, our, we're risking so much by the climate change, by letting go what's going on. The world of risk is really a pretty amazing world. But it, it helps so much to just face it, just face it and say, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, that, that the police come confronting us, that could happen to me, could happen to me. And, and, whoa, of the various ways of dying, actually that's not so bad, right? To die for the common good, which is what the soldier and the police officer is committed to, they're willing to die for the common good. I should not be willing to die for the common good. So that's the way to look at it too. You know? like, I only want to die on my own terms. Oh, well, good luck. You know, so there's, there's a lot to think about. And everybody's process would be the same, so it wouldn't necessarily be the same. Like, I mean, everybody's process is their own, so it wouldn't necessarily look like mine. But I do want to emphasize, whatever your process is, for coming to terms with it, it is freeing. It is freeing to do it. It is freeing to do it. So I hear two things. One is about the comparison of the Civil War. The Civil War couldn't have happened without state power. So it was the states seceding and the states organizing armies and the states. So it was a war between the states. We often forget that. Uh, and I, I don't see any scenario in which there's going to be a war between the states. I mean, sometimes people say, well, California, Oregon, and Washington against the rest of the country. But I don't think it's really good. To, state, state power is not going to get into this struggle. This is going to be a mass people struggle, uh, you know, grass, grassroots based. 
not state-based. Um, so with regard to the uh, use of violence as part of our variety of tactics uh, that we could use, um, the, we are in a way stronger position now to be clear about that than we were during the civil rights days. In civil rights days, uh, the main case that could be made was, look, SNCC survived in Mississippi nonviolently. It would not have survived <laughs> if they had been going in there with guns. And everybody could see, oh, that's true. They would not have survived. So it was, but it was very immediate. It was without the uh, sociological and political science work that had been done. Since, tremendous lot has been done. Um, I especially point to the work of Chenoweth and Stefan, uh, who have compared, who have looked at mass, and I, I so appreciate, because I, I very often, because of my fascination with campaigns, look at smaller aggregations, and they are, they love big picture, you know, like collective struggles, statewide, uh, I mean national struggles. And so they've done a, an actual statistical comparison of the mass struggles that have used violence and the mass struggles that have used nonviolence. And they found that the struggles that chose nonviolence had twice the chance of success mm -hmm. as the <coughs> movements that chose violence. I so the, yeah, the, the case is, uh, is overwhelming. Um, Wart, I had a debate uh, at this very university with Ward Churchill many years ago uh, in which he argued for violence, I argued for nonviolence. And uh, I, we were on the same, we were on a panel a couple of months ago <laughs> in Bolivia. Hey, we're not doing any tour. And uh, he's so mellowed out. It was almost disappointing to me. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, the, the evidence is just uh, open and shut. I don't think we're going to have much trouble. But I do address the question it, with relation to self-defense because that's, that's kind of the last preserve, right, of the folks who want us to keep exploring violence is, well, but okay, if you're doing not violence, but you want to protect yourself, um, uh, with, with it, say, by carrying a gun because of this or that. And, uh, and so I do address that in the book. I think you'll find it useful. Verisimilitude, that is, creating in the campaign some of the actual feelings of uh, risk and uh, calling upon one's core in the course of the training makes it a much more powerful training. Because they're beyond you know, instruction to heart. Well, there, there is quite a growth, again, since the Civil Rights Movement in, in uh, the field of nonviolence training. And the outstanding group, the group that a lot of other groups hire to upgrade their training is called Training for Change. Training for Change is, is a group that I co-founded uh, in the early 90s, and I ran that for 15 years. We worked on, six, but I guess, four continents and have uh, really figured out the training thing. And somebody has a book. Yes, please. Would you hold it up? So that's the result of, uh, of my work of about 40, 50 years of teaching and training, of find, trying to find ever more impactful ways of supporting people to go into those situations where we so easily feel overwhelmed, but uh, don't need to. Turns out, training can have an almost magical effect. One of my closest friends, a millennial, who was heavy into social media, Facebook, and so on and so on, is now counseling everybody, don't, forget about Facebook. <laughs> it's a net loss for us. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it, uh, it's poisonous, it's toxic, he says. Don't, don't use Facebook, uh, except for very, very instrumental, you know, short-term reasons. Um, and the studies I now are, are now accumulating. People get more, depression is associated with Facebook use. Uh, the more Facebook use, the more depressed people get, and so on and so on. So, um, so that so you're right. That's not the way to go in order to be able to make these combinations work. And the question mark is is right there. Um, I think your field has tremendous contribution to make. I think conflict resolution, again, a field that's grown enormously since the Civil Rights Movement, enormously, uh, needs, to, uh, needs to be right in there assisting because, it's, uh, because not only are we being manipulated to divide, 
but also there is a passion. You know, I'm an environmentalist. I don't want to dilute my issue by calling it power level green jobs, and it's all about this and that and stuff like that. Uh, so some of, some of this, uh, some of the divisiveness comes from a wonderful kind of passion with the thing I've decided to focus on. Right. So we need the assistance of conflict resolution tools and people like yourself who would be able to jump into the fray. Now, um, insofar as conflict resolution um, providers uh, have grown to depend on highly structured situations, that's, uh, that could be problematic. Because a lot of the conflicts will emerge in informal situations, right, in shouting matches and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, adding, adding to your uh, toolkit um, interventions that can be made when things seem to be more in a state of breakdown than of uh, you know, conflict management, um, then that's, that's useful as well. And uh, an author who has made a lot of difference for me is a guy named uh, Mindel, uh, Arnold Mindel, uh, whose kind of psychology that he's offering is process work. It's called, it's called process work. And the application to large group conflict is called world work. And uh, he, he has books out. You can easily Google those. And Mendel, I've been with Mendel in rooms of three, 400 people in which subgroups of them say Catholics and Protestants from Northern Ireland or upper caste Hindus and untouchables from India or Israelis and Palestinians have been at it. And the, 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 they've got facilitation models that, uh, or, or uh, tools that are very useful. I found myself shortly after the, um, the former Yugoslav war with a bunch of young people who were Serbs and Croats and uh, Albanians and uh, who else? You know, the, the, uh, the, the other group, uh, totally at hammer and tongs, and was able to use his methodology, I think maybe I described it in the book there, in order to see that group through the conflict. Three hours of screaming at each other, veins sticking out of people's necks, the whole deal, and coming through the conflict onto the other side in which there was a phenomenal comrade, comradeship that developed. Right. So, I, I, you know, it can be done, and I'm so glad you're around. Going back to your, the comment you made about your brother, do, do you find that dialogue sometimes going in that direction? Because you mentioned something about changing the language. I found that that was a, a pretty interesting part. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We always have, framing is one of the most important things, right? Right. In conflict resolution, absolutely. Absolutely. So people in the vision may use, uh, use the isms a lot, you know, and use the ideological resources and so on. I see them as great resources to be tapped. But that doesn't mean that then in the presentation of the vision, when we're going out to get people to sign up for it, that we need to use those, those kinds of languages. The Movement for Black Lives put out a vision in 2016 that's worth looking at in those terms, because I found it very refreshing how little sectarian language they used. And they actually offered a vision, and a lot of people signed on to it, including the board of directors of the American Friend Service Committee which does not readily sign on to somebody else's statement, but they signed on to it. So again, Googling movement for black lives is a great uh, encouraging thing. Yes, I mean, could, could four million people have responded to the inauguration <laughs> without social media? So clearly, and the, I'm told that uh, the Egyptian uh, part of the Arabic awakening was very fueled by the use of social media. So it can be very, very useful, but people have to understand the downside. And, and that's what my friend Daniel Hunter keeps saying, that people, that there's a kind of addiction that can happen. You know, I put an input in and then I have to know what the response is going to be. And so the, the, the sort of spiritual training, the Buddhists offer of non-attachment. We, we do our thing and we move on. I'm on a book tour and tomorrow I'm in San Francisco or whatever. No, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm here. <laughs> the next day I'm in San Francisco, and I have to let Boulder go. <laughs> I think, uh, yes, yeah, I, I think uh, continuing to be innovative about languages really is valuable. It's, it is valuable. Um, I use the language that I think will uh, convey the most sense to the most people in a diverse 
community. So I use words like campaign, which is also used by the electoral world and also used by the military world. And I use uh, combat, nonviolent combat, because we understand that to be confrontation. We understand that to be like, uh, you know, face to face. And uh, sometimes people think uh, if I don't use a word like that, that I'm talking about talk. Maybe we could talk our way into a better world. And so I have to uh, use the word fight, for example, if I think that'll, that'll communicate more clearly. We are talking about conflict. We are saying yes to conflict. It is, by the way, deeply human to be in conflict, deeply human to be in conflict, and deeply nurturing of innovation to be in conflict. No conflict, no innovation. If you're willing to live in a world without innovation, then give up on conflict. But if you like innovation, I do. Conflict is definitely one of our fabulous uh, human uh, capabilities. Um, so, yeah, so, but uh, each of us has to take responsibility. I'm glad you raised the question because each of us does have to take responsibility for the framings we use and the words we choose. And uh, I use target for the opponent, a column of the opponent. I call the bank the opponent even before they've had a chance to show themselves to be the opponent. Um, Partly as a signal to a lot of the people I'm talking to, we already know their record. <laughs> and we know where they stand in the, uh, in the larger scheme of things. And I, we don't think that calling them something nice uh, will change that because it's not being nice that guides their, their choices. It's not about being nice that guides their choices. So, uh, but but I, I'm also fine with challenge um, language and keeping on innovating and finding other, other language that works better. I, I recommend that we accept that we're being surveilled. I, I'm proud that I've been surveilled at least since the 60s. Um, in very large groups, when I notice that there are people who would be worried about that, I welcome any FBI people present. Um, I think I already remarked to somebody, uh, yeah, you, you said you wanted to take photographs, and I said, oh, it's such fun to be asked about photographs because I assume I'm being photographed by the FBI and uh, they're not asking, so it's fun to be asked. <laughs> so uh, we in the Earthquake Reaction Team regard it as a wonderful thing to be, be surveilled. We know that the, uh, both corporations we've been up against have surveilled us. We take that as a, as a matter of pride. Hey, we are so important. They put staff time and energy and money into, into uh, mapping us and keeping track of us and reading our emails and, and, and so on and so on. They wouldn't bother if we weren't important. Isn't that wonderful? Yay, we've broken through into being surveilled. Hooray. With any luck, we're being infiltrated as well. One of our numbers is an FBI person. Yay, I hope they'd be willing to put that kind of investment because we are really dangerous to them. Yay, isn't that fun? Isn't that fun to be dangerous? So you see how my response is to play a little jujitsu uh, fun with, uh, with that whole fear thing. I mean, Gandhi was so right about that. You know, fear is, fear is the enemy. He kept saying to the Indian people, the only reason the British are here, I mean, the, the little old Britain, Britain, you know, all the island all the way over in the Atlantic, the only reason they are here running this enormous nation is because we fear them. If we gave up fear today, they'd be out of here tomorrow. So... I, I have a lot of fun with activists in that way because activists very often stimulate each other's fear. I remember going to a l very large conference in Florida not long after the Trump, the Trump thing, and it was mostly young people, and they were all scaring each other. Did you hear the latest thing that Trump said? Did you hear, he just made a cabinet appointment, such and such, and they're going to do this and this to us, and so on and so on. And they were all running around scaring each other. So I said, I, I, want, I want a chance to speak. I, I, I think I, I understand a lot of people here are working hard for Trump. Trump wants to scare us, and you're doing his work for him. So I, I just want to remind you to, to invoice. <laughs> invoice Trump because if you're going to work for him to volunteer for him seems strange <laughs> so if you're going to work for him spread the fear about Trump I think you ought to invoice him you know just like figure like lawyers you know billable hours you're, 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 you're putting a lot of billable hours in doing Trump's work for him he wants the whole nation to be terrified of him and you're helping out a lot 
and people's jaws were dropping open. Oh my God, we never thought of it that way. Well, it, our, the witching hour has come, and so we get to uh, conclude the formal part of this. I really hope that lots of you will uh, drop by the bookstore. Um, my publisher, Melville House, loves independent bookstores, considers them a really important part of, of a good community. And so even though I know sometimes people will just you know, go ahead to Amazon or something and buy a book. I really hope that you'll encourage, you'll, you'll like get yourself over to a Boulder bookstore or another bookstore to buy these books. And that you'll remember Viking economics because some of the most important things I learned that like tipped me off to American historical uh, analogies came from the writing of the Viking book, Viking economics book. And because its model can be part of our vision. And since we need a vision, in my view, in order to cement the work of the CR people to develop a movement of movements, we need a vision. I think at least it would help very much if we had a vision for that. Um, then we might as well take a vision from people who know what they're doing and have done it for whatever, four decades, five decades of success. And it's fun to have a vision that's got a track record. So I hope you'll just appreciate all those things. And I know I appreciate you and your questions. Thanks again, folks. Thank you. Thank you.